This lecture is on reading secondary sources. Key to reading a source critically is assessing the source. There are some questions you need to ask about it in order to better understand it, to determine just how trustworthy of a source it is, just how much you can rely on it, and even whether or not you should even use it in your paper. A big question, of course, is who actually wrote the source. And I don't just mean the person's name, but something about them. For example, what does that person do for a living? What are their credentials? So for example, a book written by a PhD in history about history is probably going to be more scholarly reliable than a book written by someone who has an undergraduate degree in say mass communications or in uh, music, right? Nothing against those majors, of course, but it does matter who you are, what your training is in, right? Another thing that has to be considered is, does that person have any clear political leanings or anything like that, or any other attributes that might imply some sort of bias, right? Now, one thing I have to stress is people are often kind of hard on each other about this issue of bias. I don't see how we can't be biased, right? I would argue human beings, uh, myself included, are naturally biased. We have certain assumptions about the way the world works. And we tend to process information. We tend to write with that understanding. The idea of having a scholarly community is that we can catch each other if we're being too biased, right? In any case, the key thing, though, I want to stress is you have to be able to assess this. Someone might have a bias. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that we can just dismiss what they have to say. But at the same time, if you're reading a, a, a book where the author has a clear bias and you don't know much about that subject... It's going to be harder for you to read that book critically. It might be better to read something else. Another big question is who published it? For example, was this source published by a university press or a respectable academic press that's not a university press? So, for example, Brill is not a university press. However, it is considered an academically respectable press, as is like Roman and Littlefield. But for the most part, you want to be looking for places uh or for books that have been published by university presses. So for example, Harvard University Press, Oxford University Presses, those are generally good presses. That doesn't mean that everything they publish is good, but it does mean that it had to go through some sort of peer review, right? As opposed to say self-publishing, which anyone can kind of put up there. And there's what we call vanity publishers. There's places who will publish your book if you pay them, right? They don't care whether the good book is good or not. All they care is whether your check is good or not. Don't want to use that most likely as a source. Another big question, of course, is when was the source published? Right? Especially in this class, it's better to look at newer sources first. Right? And in history, sometimes what happens is documents that may not have been available in the past, uh, for example, are suddenly declassified and we can now look at them. So, for example, when the Soviet Union fell apart, all of a sudden documents that Western researchers could not look at, suddenly they could look at. So if you try and read a book about the Soviet Union that was published in the 1970s or 80s, there's going to be a lot of guessing there. It's better to read something, focus on something in a short paper like this, on something later, after people had access to more information. I think it's best to go through some kind of concrete examples. So let's say that your topic is American POWs during the Korean War. And, oh, look, here's a book called Cold Days in Hell, American POWs. POWs in Korea. Well, that seems perfect. So uh, that's a book that I need to spend time to look at. And I look into it and I find out the, the author uh, is a man named William Clark Latham, which is a junior, which is helpfully displayed on the front cover. And uh, doing some research, in fact, just looking at the dust jacket, I learned that he's the course director at the U.S. Army Logistics University in Fort Lee. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, that's not a historian. Right. Uh, the guy must be uh, educated, of course, if he's working as a uh, course director. Uh, logistics is a highly technical field. It's the field of supply in the military. So he's, he's likely a, a smart person. But I don't see anything about him having a particular uh, history education. OK, well, something to know. Published by Texas A&M University. Not a bad university, but not a major university in terms of Korean studies. Right. So that's something that is just got to think about, but of course, you know, people can approach American POWs in Korea without being in Korean studies, right? American historian could certainly do that. 
published in 2014. Pretty recent, pretty recent. Now, what I can tell you, because I've read this entire book and I actually signed it in a class, is that the book is problematic. Uh, as I said earlier, the author is not a historian, uh, and he is, in fact, a soldier. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a soldier, of course, but one thing about this is that he is not sufficiently critical in examining his uh, sources, and he has a very clear desire, as we'll t see later, to defend uh, Americans, uh, basically, and tries to argue that the POWs were war heroes. And um, I think he, he goes a little bit too far in this. And so he doesn't uh, critically examine these sources or even follow what the conclusions. So, for example, when he does find examples of American POWs behaving unheroically, he kind of ignores them and doesn't, even if he mentions them. So it's problematic. However, you can still use a problematic source, right? First of all, this is a recent work that has a lot of great footnotes that provides really useful background information gives you a lot of good sources, right? So you can still learn something about American POWs in Korea. And if this is what you're interested in and you don't know much about it, this is a great place to start. And he goes through chronologically. So if you were interested in this subject, you could choose a chapter from that. That would give you good background information. Look at the relevant primary sources. You've got a good foundation. And in particular, this is a great way to develop your paper because you would say, you know, some research has been done. Uh, one example is this Cold Days in Hell book, but there are some problems that my paper will address, right? So you can still use a problematic source as long as you're careful about it. Now, how do you know it's problematic? Well, one of the first things you should do when you look at a source, right, after kind of noting the author, noting who, who published it, is to look at the introduction, right? A lot of times when you're used to reading textbooks, you might be skip the introduction. Right? It just seems like, well, it's not that important. I want to get to the content. That's what I'm taking the exam on. But in monographs, books about a single subject, the introduction is extraordinarily important. Extraordinarily important. You want to read it very, very carefully. So fortunately, and one reason I chose this book for us to examine closely is that the introduction is only like two pages long, which is itself a warning. That's far too short of an introduction, right? Uh, it's, it's just not enough. And that's where this author, you can see, is not trained historian. We need to spend a lot more time introducing the subject. In any case, it starts off with this uh, couple sentences. Uh, An old axiom claims that truth is the first casualty in war. This principle seems particularly applicable to American service members captured during the Korean conflict. Although their fate played a crucial role in, in the war's outcome, historians tend to overlook both their ordeals in captivity and their subsequent mistreatment after repatriation. So you can kind of get a sense here that he is writing what we call a revisionist work. This is a work that seeks to address a misunderstanding uh, of a particular subject, right? So people have misunderstood things, so we need to revise it. So, okay, not quite a thesis statement, but we can kind of see where the guy is going, right? We can kind of see where he's going. He's saying there has been a misunderstanding about these American POWs taken during the Korean conflict. And he continues, on the other hand, the prisoners of Korea have repeatedly served as scapegoats. Citing their appalling death rate and exaggerated claims of widespread misconduct, critics pointed to this group of prisoners as proof that the prisoners themselves were somehow complicit in their own demise. Those who survived were subsequently branded as traitors and potential spies, thanks to anti-communist fervor and the Pentagon's own ham efforts to prosecute alleged collaborators. So, okay. Not quite to a thesis statement. Actually, he never gets to a thesis statement. That's a problem with the book. But we can kind of see where he's going here, right? This is going to serve as a thesis statement. People have misunderstood and unfairly criticized uh, these American POWs. And therefore, rather than being, um, he's basically saying that the, the, the fact is that it's actually all the opposite of this, right? Uh, these guys were not traitors. They were not potential spies. Uh, they were treated unfairly. Um, they were not uh, complicit in their own demise. And is, he basically tries to argue that they're heroes. And that's, that's maybe possible, but that's not usually the, what a historian would do. The author does do a good job, and this is one reason why I think it's still a good work to read, is he's, he 
has some good sources uh, based on memoirs, uh, trial transcripts, debriefings, declassified government reports, published analyses and media coverage, as well as conversations, interviews and correspondence with several dozen former prisoners. This work seeks to correct misperceptions that linger six decades after the American prisoners of war came home. Great. He mentioned his pup, his uh, sources. And if you want to see those sources, he's got a bibliography. He's got footnotes. Wonderful stuff, right? Pick a chapter. Read that chapter carefully. Look at the associated footnotes in the back. You'll get lots of great information. He then goes on to write, the most important work in this field is that of Dr. Albert Biederman, whose 1963 book, March to Calumny, thoroughly and convincingly refuted claims the American POWs in Korea had betrayed their country. More recently, several other distinguished authors have sought to explain what really happened to American prisoners in Korea. Australian scholar Jeffrey Gray has also contributed greatly to this field of study through his analysis of Commonwealth POWs, whose experience paralleled that of American prisoners in many ways. In recent years, Robert Doyle's Voice of Captivity, Philip Chimney's Atrocity, exclamation point, Raymond Leck's Broken Soldiers, and Lewis Carlson's Remember Prisoners of a Forgotten War have examined specific elements of the Korean War POW experience in great detail. Although my own research falls in their footsteps, each of these four gentlemen have been remarkably generous with his time, assistance, and encouragement. Now, uh, there's a couple problems with this. Uh, the, the author just doesn't go in enough detail. He doesn't say what he's borrowing from them. He never really talks about them again, nor does he explain why he needs to write a book when um, apparently the most important work has already been written. Right? If the uh, these claims that he seeks to be addressing have been thoroughly and convincingly refuted already, what's the point of writing another book? Now, there might be a good reason, but he doesn't give one. Right? He doesn't give one. And again, you can still use this because this gives you a sense of what important works, works are out there. It allows and it, it emphasizes the point that you need to explain what your work does, right? So you would say, okay, uh, Latham does not do this. I can show that. I'll look at this March of Calumny books, which he, he says is the most important. I'll check that and I'll see how I can add something, right? That's how you build on this uh, with, your, uh, in, with your own research. Now, that was an example of a book that I would say, you know, you can use, just be careful. Now, now I want to give you an example of a book, uh, also one that I assigned. I, I like to assign problematic books because I want students to gain, gain confidence criticizing books instead of just, you know, just taking them as, as just always true. Now, let's say that your topic is Syngman Rhee during the Korean War, and you see a book called The Korean War, A History. And that sounds really good. Right? That sounds really good. Uh, maybe this will give me some good information. Who wrote it? Uh, is a guy named Bruce Cummings. Okay, cool. Uh, who's he? Well, he's a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, that's a good university, and they do some good work on Korean history. So that is a positive. And one thing I want to tell you, um, I saw Bruce Cummings uh, speak at a conference, and uh, the conference room was standing room only. Right, This is a very, very popular, well-known historian. So that was one reason I assigned it was I was like, okay, there we go. But something kind of odd about it. Who published it? Modern library publishers, not a publishing house I had heard of beforehand, not known for its academic works, but uh, it's Bruce Cummings, right? Uh, maybe it's all right. And this is where our old friend Wikipedia comes in because you could maybe look him up on Wikipedia and see, okay, who is this guy? Well, one thing that is interesting, it talks about here, and this is from the, all these quotes are from the Wikipedia article on him, right? He's a big enough name. He's got his own page. Uh, it talks about how he won the Kim Dae Jook Award. That's really cool for his contributions to democracy, human rights, and peace. Neat. Um, cool. Named in honor of the 2000 Nobel Peace Prize winner and former president of South Korea, Kim Dae Jung, who we um, had talked about before. Uh, and it notes that it recognizes his outstanding scholarship engaged public activity regarding human rights and democratization during the decades of dictatorship in Korea and after it ended. And if you look at the beginning of this book, he actually dedicated it to President Kim Dae-jong, right? Okay. And he notes dissident, dissident politician, statesman, conciliator, peacemaker. So one thing I can tell you about this is this puts him squarely on the political left, right? Now, does that necessarily mean anything? Not necessarily. But it does emphasize here that he has a political position. He's been recognized for holding that political position that might impact how he writes, right? Now, does that necessarily mean that he's going to write poorly or make historical mistakes? No, right? You can oppose dictatorship in Korea 
right, and before democratization, and still write good history. And as we continue, though, we note that he was part of something called the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars. And this is what's awesome about Wikipedia, is it provides a link to the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, because I didn't know what it was. I followed the link and it says, oh, this was founded in 1968, if you've taken Dr. Witherspoon's class in 1968, you know, a very important year, by a group of graduate students and younger faculty as part of their opposition to the American participation in the Vietnam War. They proposed a radical critique of what of the assumptions which got us into, into China and were keeping us from getting out. So that puts him pretty squarely, again, on the left. And this is when you may say, okay, this is going to be interesting. This guy's either going to have a really neat perspective or he's going to go to kind of go off the rails. Right. Because for a lot of Americans who opposed the Vietnam War, the Korean War was kind of just like dress rehearsal for Vietnam. Right. So now we have we know that he not only has a, a particular political position. He also is something of an activist with that position. Now, again, skimming through Wikipedia, I see this information that there's a review of the book, uh, an excerpt from the review of the book, The Korean War. OK, where William Stuck who is uh, one of the authors in the list of possible sources, writes that Cummings displays a limited graphs of sources that have, published, have emerged since he published his second volume on the war's origins in 1990, and that readers wanting an up-to-date account of the war and all its complexity, complexity should look elsewhere. Ooh, right, not good. So here you have a, another academic saying, look, this book is problematic because it doesn't actually deal with the most recent sources. Right. It's basically focusing on the research that Cummings did way back in the 1980s in preparation for his book, The Origins of the Korean War, in 1990. Right. So eh, this book's not sounding so good. It's sounding kind of problematic. You know, maybe I just shouldn't mess with this. I need to look at a different source for information about Sigmund Rhee. Right. This book is just not going to work. Also, you can know from the index of the book that it doesn't really say that much about Re. And one thing I could tell you, having read the whole book and assigned it, Cummings, um, he does allow in this book his political, I think, uh, leanings to cause him to misunderstand and to um, make, mis just bluntly speaking, make historical mistakes in terms of interpretation. For example, uh, he has this desire to try and... Um, make North Korea not look as bad as it's usually presented. And generally, I'm fine with that. But he talks about how when North Koreans like murdered American POWs, how it was very humane because they shot them uh, in the back of the head behind the ear. And that's a, a humane way of killing someone. Um, and uh, I think a more humane thing would be not to kill them. Right. You know, maybe not shooting people who are tied up in the back of the head. Maybe that would be good. So that's the kind of thing that you see in that book. And that's why it's not such a good book. Now, you may say, oh, though, this book, The Origins of the Korean War, that might be better. And it might be. That might be something you would look at. But it's not going to help you with Sigmund Rhee because, uh, in, during the Korean War, because you'll note um, it's from the years 1945 to 1947. Might provide some good background information. But in any case, pretty certain that this Bruce Cummings book will not work, you know, to discard it, right? Um, in the case of Latham, that book, uh, there are some problems, but still useful. This, this book, eh, not so good. Now, again, I want to stress that just having a particular political leaning does not mean you're a good historian. So the example I want to give you here is this woman, uh, Professor Sheila Miyoshi Yeager. She is a very good historian. I've read uh, one of her books and I and uh, have looked at this book, Brothers at War, uh, which is a very good book and one I would recommend that you look at uh, as it's a fairly recent study of not only the Korean War, but what happened afterwards. So even if you're not looking at the Korean War and you just want a good general history, her book is good, right? Um, I've read uh, good portions of it, haven't finished the whole thing at the time of this recording, but I've read enough of it that I trust her as a historian. She, like Cummings, is on the political left and, and I believe rather far on the political left. Uh, just as a, a curious aside to show, give you a sense of her political leanings, um, when former President uh, Obama was in his uh, community organizing days, uh, they actually lived together and President Obama um, proposed to her twice, right? President Obama would propose to her and uh, she rejected him both times, right? Said no to him both times. And then she went on and married, had uh, several children and then wrote uh, a, a good book uh, and then followed up with another good book. 
And like I said, this is someone who is an example of somebody who is on the political left. I think uh, Pence, I mean, it's always difficult to say, you know, what constitutes the far left or the far right or whatever. But I think she's pretty far on the left, but that didn't stop her from writing a good book. So the key thing is, even if you have strong political views or any other kind of view, as long as you're dedicated to being a good scholar and following where the sources lead and following the data, it's fine, right? My criticism of Cummings was he just, and of Latham, was that they don't do that. Latham wants to defend the American POWs, so he doesn't really follow up when they are behaving badly, uh, I think, adequately. Uh, Cummings, um, he's just not happy about what the American government did in Vietnam. Uh, he's not particularly happy with what happened in the Korean War, and so he just sees uh, he sees things in this kind of very black and white way and is, I think, overly critical of the United States and the Republic of Korea and overly friendly to the DPRK. In any case, it's important to know these things to be able to see, is the source okay? Uh, how much can I trust this? But but just the, it, just the possibility of bias, though, doesn't mean we can just dismiss the source, right? It's whether the bias actually has an effect. I have another example I want us to look at. Not everything should be about the Korean War. And I, I want us to look at something that's not necessarily so political, but also how religious perspectives can kind of shape how we see things. So let's say that you're interested in looking at some topic on American Protestant missionaries in Korea. And here, uh, let's say especially you're interested in something like democratization and what role American Protestant missionaries played in that. Well, you find this book called Protestantism and Politics in Korea. That seems really good. Okay, let's look at the uh, information of the author. The author is a man named uh, Chung Shun Park. And uh, he is a professor of Christian studies at Sung Shil University. Uh, that's a Korean university. Um, it is a Korean uh, Protestant Christian university. And he's a specialist on Christian studies there. So you could probably guess he is a Protestant. And he certainly is. And I'll give you some examples later. There is a bit of a possible bias. Uh, and I'll talk more about this later. He's probably, I think, a pro-liberal Protestant a little bit more of a, a left Protestant. And I'm not trying to pick on people on the political left. It's just that they're more likely to be academics than people on the political right. Uh, Latham is more on the right. Um, but in any case, it's possible that he uh, has that leaning. But this book was published by the University of Washington Press, which is an excellent uh, center for Korean studies and is a public university. So that tells us that even if he does have this kind of perspective, it maybe isn't something that really is going to impact this in any kind of uh, negative way, right? So that's that we, we can have a little bit more trust because this is a university press. And like I said, it's University of Washington, which is considered a good Korean studies press. Now, one thing I think that's important to do uh, when looking at a book is you can actually learn a lot by looking at the book. Uh, this book has a dust cover and in the dust cover, you can find a picture of Dr. Park and there he is. And I don't know, I, I like to know what the people look like who are um, reading the writing the books I read. And has a nice little uh, kind of introduction. It says, following its introduction to Korea in the late 19th century, Protestantism grew rapidly in number of followers and in influence and re remains a dominant social and political force throughout the 20th century. In Protestant po uh, Protestantism and politics in Korea, Chung Shun Park charts this stunning growth and examines the shifting political associations of Korean Protestantism. Okay, so now we know what it's about. It's going to talk about how Protestant Christianity has had a strong influence on Korea and how that influence has uh, changed as uh, politically as the religion has grown. Okay, this sounds interesting, right? This might work. And he continues to write, uh, after World War II and the division of the Korean Peninsula, however, most Protestant institutions in South Korea were conscripted into the fight against communism. In addition, they became involved in the post-war push for rapid economic development. These alliances led to increasing political conservatism so that mainstream Korean process eventually became a stalwart defender of the th th authoritarian status quo. A small liberal minority remained politically active, supporting social and human rights causes throughout the 1960s and 1970s, laying the foundation for mass protests and gradual de democratic liberaliz liberalization in the 1980s. Park documents the theological evolution of Korean Protestantism from early fundamentalism to more liberal doctrines and shows how this evolution was reflected in the political landscape. Now, read between the lines again, you can see this has a moderate kind of pro-left perspective uh, it's pro-democracy. I don't have a problem with that. I'm pro-democracy, and I think that's a bias, but that's a good bias <laughs> in my biased opinion, right? And that's why I mean it. A bias isn't necessarily bad. We just have to realize it. And what he's trying to argue, you can get a sense from this, is that, you know, uh, Protestant Christianity has changed, 
And in, unfortunately, because of the way it changed, it has some problems in that it, too much of it embraced uh, conservatism and embraced uh, dictatorship and anti-communism. However, there were a small group of liberal Protestants who were politically active uh, against, uh, against the regime for human rights and stuff like that. And if you're interested in that uh, uh, American Protestants and democratization, you now know this is a great book. Now, you know, you have to, to be careful when you read it because it may not be that fair uh, to some of the, the more conservative Protestant Christians. That's something you could address by reading more. But the key thing here is not that we should dismiss this book because it has a bias. All books have a bias. Rather, we know what the bias is and we read it carefully, knowing that we can learn from people uh, e even if we disagree with them. So like I say, uh, this I've read this book. Excellent book, as long as you are aware of that this is the author's kind of frame of reference and you want to make sure that you take what he says, especially about the conservative Protestants who he disagrees with, with a grain of salt, and maybe you want to be a little more critical of the, the more liberal Protestants he agrees with, that's fine. You just keep that in mind as you read the book. Now, of course, key to using this book effectively is looking at the table of contents. A lot of times, books are written, uh, history books especially, in chronological order, and that can be helpful. So you know that if you're going to look at the post-war period, for example, and I, by, I mean post-Korean War, you know that chapters four and five are not going to be particularly useful. You want to read a later chapter, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you're interested in early American Protestant missionaries, okay, great. Chapter four looks useful. The Protestant Church and Early Nationalist Politics, 1880 to 1919. That'll be good. You also know, uh, and if you flip through these chapters, you, you'll see that these uh, first three chapters are kind of out of chronological order. Uh, he's looking at like he does an over chronological overview of the growth of Protestantism. And then he looks at the theological orientation and so forth. And you could look at, flip through those chapters, maybe they're not so useful. But the key thing here is you don't want to sit down and read every single book, every single page. That's not necessary. That will bog you down. You want to look at those parts of the book that are particularly helpful. You read the introduction carefully, know what the book's about. Then you'll know what parts of the book to read. You'll know what, part, what chapters in particular you should focus on. And of course, not only is the table of contents useful, but the index is also useful. If you have a look at the uh, index here, let's say that you know that you want to do research on Horace Underwood, you could uh, import an American missionary to Korea. You would know from going to the index, index looking up Underwood Horace, there's only two references, each only one page. So you know that this is probably not a good source about Horace Underwood himself. Maybe some good background information about Horace uh, Underwood in terms of just talking about Protestant missionaries in general, but this isn't going to give a lot of information as an individual. Book could still be useful for understanding Horace Underwood, going to give you a good understanding of the background, but they're not going to say much about him at, at all. Um, it, you may say, well, I'm interested in Americans. You would look up America and it's not in the index, but United States is. And you can tell from looking at that smaller arrow, there's not really that much on the U.S., so if you're interested in more of a U.S. focused paper, this book's not maybe so useful, right? If you're more interested in, though, if you're looking at this issue of U.S.-Korean relations and, and Protestantism, but you're focusing more on the Korea side, then this book would be more likely to be useful, right? You have to, again, you have to kind of judge how useful is this book, how useful uh, will it be in my research. So one thing I want to do in our last example is to introduce you to a colleague of mine uh, Dr. Tori. What's funny about uh, Dr. Tori is that her first name is very, very difficult to pronounce. And when Koreans try and pronounce it, it comes out as Toki, which means rabbit. So she has taken the nickname of Bunny. Uh, and academics will, uh, you know, in, in, in informal settings, not, not publicly, but when we're just sitting around chatting, we call her Bunny. Um, and uh, I just always get a, a kick out of that. Uh, Dr. Bunny, in a sense. But Dr. Tori is an amazing scholar. Uh, she's just a, a, a wonderful person. Just what a uh, someone, whenever I go to a conference, I'm always happy to see her, to chat with her. But the reason I bring her up in particular is, again, because of this issue of bias and assessing uh, secondary sources. So Dr. Tori, the reason her and I talk a lot is because she also looks at uh, Korean Catholicism, especially the period of persecution. Now, Dr. Tori has the best uh, Korean skills I know of any uh, non-Korean person. Uh, she speaks like a Korean. In fact, her Korean is, I think, better than most Koreans. Uh, I find her Korean easier to understand uh, than Korean people most of the time because it's just so perfect. She also teaches Korean. And the reason is because she was born in Korea. She was the child of missionaries. Uh, it was interesting. They were American missionaries. They were Episcopalians. 
right? Uh, which is uh, part of the Anglican communion. And uh, her, they were also interested by Pentecostal Christianity, which is, is, is an interesting mix. But she um, was born in Korea and her father and mother established something called Yesuon, which means Jesus Abbey. And basically they built out in the middle of nowhere uh, in the mountains, this uh, kind of small Christian community. It's a voluntary community. If you want to join, you can join. If you want to leave, you can leave. Uh, you know, sometimes we talk about small Christian community. People might think, oh, cult. No, they're not. Uh, I have a problem with that word. But uh, in any case, it's definitely not very cultish. It's it's for people who want to have some time to kind of withdraw from the world, um, to pray. While they're there, they would have to engage in work, though. And this is important because in Korea, uh, traditionally work with your hands has been looked down upon. But Jesus was a carpenter. So there's kind of a problem with being a Christian and looking down on work. So this is a place where you could, in a sense, work and pray following the, the kind of Benedictine mode of spirituality. But that's why her Korean is so good. And she decided as uh, to write a paper about this. And she wants to continue her research here. Now, this is where you have to really be careful about issues of bias, right? Um, because it would be very easy for her just to talk about how awesome her dad is and how awesome her mom is and how this place is the greatest place in the world. Um, and it, or you could have the opposite, right? You could have her, uh, this is not what happened, but you know, sometimes you have people who are very bitter and angry at their parents. And, uh, that, that's something that could happen. She could just be like, well, I'm going to sort of tear apart this place, but she doesn't do that. She's a very good scholar is very careful in her research. And even though she, um, has this possible bias, she doesn't let it get in the way of doing good research. And I bring this up because it's important to reflect on your own biases, areas where you might be biased that might cause you to misunderstand or misjudge things. And there has to be a point where you say, I can't do the research on this topic because I'm just too biased, right? There are certain subjects I will not study, um, or rather I should say I will not, not do research on and, and try and publish because I don't think I can be fair, right? Uh, Dr. Tori, I think does a great job. Uh, and I want to share with you an article in which she, I think is a good example of how to do a good job of writing a paper in a, uh, even when you have a possible bias without it going in that area. One thing also I want to introduce this article for was because I want you to understand like how a journal article looks. Traditionally, a journal article will have a title. You can see it there, Yesu Wan, an ongoing experiment in the Kangwondo wilderness, has her name, then it says abstract. The abstract describes what the article is about. Right? So if you want to know what the article is going to cover, read the abstract. Then below it, you'll see it gives her name and says a little bit about her. Usually they're longer, but it does give you some information. And it does, I think it's interesting, the second sentence. Notice she was the first child born to the Yesu Wolden community. And it also gives her email address. So if you were interested in, uh, if you read an article and you're like, this article is really cool. I have some questions about this research. Email the, the uh, person who wrote the article. I have had people email me. If you do do this, though, please make sure to thank them, right? I'll have a someone email me and say, oh, I'm trying to do all this research. You know, can you help me out? And I'll, I'll take time out of my day and I'll send a lot of resources and then I'll never hear a thing back. Don't do that because what happens then, professors who that happens to over and over again, stop responding to the emails. Okay, so just keep that in mind. In any case, this is traditionally what you look at. You look at the abstract, you look at who it is, tells you, you know, is this something I can trust? Well, you know, she is an assistant professor at a university, Utah, large public university. She probably knows what she's talking about. Basically trustworthy thing. But I know I have to be careful about bias because she was a part of this community. Now, I'm going to begin with her introduction. And I think she does a great job of introducing this. So I want to go through it because it makes it very clear what the article is going to be about. So this is like the first paragraph of the article. In August of 2002, several hundred people gathered at the Anglican Cathedral in Seoul, beautiful by the way, totally you should visit if you go to Seoul, to attend the funeral of Archer Torrey. Reuben Archer Torrey III uh, lived from 1918 to 2002. An American missionary and Anglican priest, best known as Te Chundok, uh, that was his Korean name, uh, founder of the Yesu One Jesus Abbey community. Most of those gathered were not Anglicans. The composition of this gathering more closely paralleled a cross section of mainstream Korean Protestantism with a minority of Anglicans and Catholics. The sermon was given by David Ross, a former Presbyterian missionary. Bouquets of white chrysanthemums at the front of the church and in the receiving room at Severance Hospital bore condolence messages from well-known Christian figures, such as Cho Yong-gi, 
founder of the Oido Gospel Church, as well as secular leaders, including the president, Kim Dae-jung. That's the president of the, the country. But most of the people in the crowd that filled the Romanesque sanctuary were or ordinary Korean Christians. When the funeral was over, a core of this group accompanied the rest of the immediate family and several abbey members on a trip to the mountains of Kangwon province, where the ashes were laid in a stone wall in the abbey community's gravesite. When Jane Torrey, uh, Dr. Torrey's mother, passed away in April 2012, the Anglican Cathedral was again filled with Christians from many denominations, and Jane's ashes were laid to rest next to archers on the hillside in Kangwondo. Isn't this a great way to begin an article? Right? We know, we have a sense what this article is going to be about. It starts with this wonderful anecdote. I mean, it, of course, it's sad, but that uh, her father uh, passed away. Um, but what's cool about it is it so clearly introduces, right, what's going on, right? She's trying to emphasize this through this funeral, that this guy had this kind of, and that Jesus Abbey were famous and were considered important by a wide group of people. She didn't just say that. She showed it, right? One thing I try and emphasize in history, show, don't tell. It's not that sources speak for themselves, but she was able very skillfully to explain what was good, what was useful, right? Well-known Christian figures, Cho Yong-gi, right? Gives him an example. Secular figures, how important were they? Well, the president showed up, right? Gives you a sense through the careful telling of facts and giving examples. She continues, the path of these funeral processions resemble the path that Archer and Jane Torrey and their son Ben followed after their arrival in Korea in 1957. Their first night was spent on the grounds of Anglican Cathedral, followed by seven years working the Anglican Seminary. They then came the defining move out to a remote valley in Kangwondo, where Archer and Jane settled permanently behind hand-built stone walls with a growing community of people of widely varying backgrounds. So she's just giving us a background information about what this actually was. And she continues, in spite of its quiet prayer-centered beginnings, 20 years after its founding, this community was being visited by eight to 10,000 guests a year, mostly members of mainstream Protestant churches. The sermons, letters, lectures, and memoirs of its founder were published as articles or as several volume collections by several Korean presses and are still easy to spot in the Christianity section of any large Korean bookstore. So now we have a nice introduction, right? We have a sense of what this community is and what, what kind of marks it out and how important it is. And then she goes on to write, in December of 2009, a reporter at News & Joy, an online newspaper aimed at promoting self-examination reform in the church, was preparing an opinion piece on the multi-million dollar building plans of a large soul-based church. The, uh, by the way, there should be a hyphen between soul and based. Oops. Uh, the reporter framed his critique as a comparison between the soul church and Jesus Abbey and went to the Abbey expecting to find agreement for his criticisms of the church. The published article revealed that the reporter had framed Jane Torrey's brief response to his question as a condemnation of the church's budget. In response to this, Jane and Kim Chunam uh, Pascal, the chair of the Abbey Council at the time, wrote to News & Joy to clarify that the article represented the reporter's personal opinion, not the position of Jim and Abbey. By the way, this, those uh, words and parentheses, she's using a different style of Chicago style that you're not learning. That's something you can learn uh, in graduate school. Uh, Jane stated that only the members of the church could judge their needs. Pascal, representing the Abbey's members, pointed out the re reporter's misrepresentation, but also affirmed the mission of News and Joy and restated the, Abbey's, restated the Abbey's position as a trans-denominational community that respects a wide variety of positions and viewpoints. So again, she's fought, she's, she gave an anecdote. to uh, She gave us some facts to tell us about the importance of this community, who it was attracted to, and she gave some clues about how she mentioned that there's lots of different types of people that were coming. And then here she talks about how people are trying to use the fame, in a sense, of Jesus Abbey to get them to support their own agendas. And then how the Abbey had to come out and say, look, we're, we're not into this criticism thing. We're not going to do that. What we are here for is representing this kind of transdenominational community where lots of different types of Christians could come, can come together. Right. She does this very skillfully through the anecdotes she has chosen. Right. And that's something to think about as you're reading and as you're writing. Right. As you read these secondary sources, think about why they're telling these stories, what they mean. And as you're writing, just I mean, I expect you, I mean, I, one thing I want to strike, stress, Bunny is a uh, literature person. Right. She does history, but her focus is literature. So that's one reason she writes so well. Right. So you don't have to write exactly like this, but just notice how skillfully she weaves all this together. And then in the last paragraph of the introduction, she writes, How did a project in the most isolated province of South Korea, begun by a handful of people led by a 40-something missionary couple affiliated with one of the smallest Christian denominations in Korea, 
become such a distinct presence and such an audible voice in the broader Korean church. Right? She has gone very skillfully, right, from these two anecdotes to show how important this community was in its characteristics. And now she can ask a good historical question, right? You may say, why are we going into so much detail? I'm just trying to show you how to read these articles. Um, how is it that a reporter would leap at the chance to back up his opinion with the AC1 authority and the AC1 members would then be compelled to make a statement qualifying their position in vigilance to what had become a public role as a bridge builder? The following pair pages narrate how a project envisioned by a missionary couple working independently of a mission board living in a community with a diverse group of Koreans became an integral part of the landscape of Christianity in Korea. So one thing you would know if you did the background reading is that Korean Christianity is very denominationally based, right? People have a very strong loyalty to their particular denomination. So the fact that you would have this kind of parachurch, transdimensional group is uh, very significant, right? And she has very carefully asked these questions, right? You know what this paper is going to be about. This paper is going to be asking, is going to be answering these questions, right? Now, here's the thing, though. There is a problem with this article. There is no clear thesis statement. She doesn't actually start to answer the question in the introduction. So when you're writing a paper, do use it to anecdotes to introduce your paper and to make your points. Do have clear questions. But if I had been asked to review this, I would say, you know, Dr. Tory needs to add a clear thesis statement after these questions so the audience knows what is the answer that they need to be on the lookout for as they read this. So what do you do? You go to the conclusion, right? Okay, I didn't see a thesis statement in the first pages. Let's go to the conclusion. And here we have something like a thesis statement or at least an answer to the questions, right? And Dr. Tory writes, the draw of Jesus Abbey on the Korean Christi Christian community can be linked to two balancing components, one challenging and the other affirming. Wow, what a wonderfully clear sentence. She gave a number, two, and she says their characteristics. One's challenging, the other's affirming. Very clear writing. It's demonstration of alternatives to many of the more limiting and divisive characteristics of mainstream Korean Christianity on the one hand, and the, on the other is promotion and practice of the mainstays of most Korean Christian traditions, prayer, spiritual disciplines, the work of the Holy Spirit, Christian community, and social concern. As for the Abbey's capacity to integrate into the landscape, this author's judgment is that it lies in a certain organicity that was basic to the community's founding, which has remained central to its configuration throughout the years. The Abbey is not a mission-based institution, but a community of mostly Korean volunteers forming an extended family. It remains independent of the directives and financial support of a foreign mission board, and its administrative structure is supported by a corporation with a Korean majority. Uh, he, she doesn't mean a uh, business corporation. She's talking about they formed a corporation to, for the property holdings and so forth for the Abbey itself. As a quasi-official part of the Daejeon Diocese of the Anglican Church, its ecclesiastical affiliation is also local. Furthermore, on the basis of its founding vision to engage in the self-sustained activities of prayer and work, the community's uh, reason for existing, I can't pronounce French, has been less dependent on external responses than would be if the vision had been mainly outreach-oriented. At the same time, the attitude of experimentation openness to the leading of the Spirit has allowed the Abbey to accept and work with whatever missions have, of their own accord, found their way to its doorstep. The stance of, let's start out with a specific vision that we can carry out on our own, fully inhabiting this physical and cultural location, and then see where the Holy Spirit leads, has perhaps been the defining facilitator of the Abbey's integration. Now, okay, so there is some bias, right? Um, Dr. Torrey clearly likes the Abbey. She clearly, uh, I think, views it as a positive thing. But that doesn't stop her from writing a deep analysis. And what she did was she was very clever in how she picked her question. And this, is again, is so important to bias. right? She knows that it's going to be difficult to write a whole bunch of bad things about the Abbey. So she writes a question, which is basically, why did the Abbey succeed? We know that it succeeded. Why did it succeed? And that's a pretty safe question to ask, right? Because she, she knows that she's going to have a tar, hard, hard time writing anything negative. Well, she's not going to have to because she's writing, why did it succeed? And she was able to do this in a very critical way. Critical doesn't mean criticizing. It means to write with a kind of depth, right? And she clearly understands something about this Abbey and how the fact that it was it was different enough that people were willing to go to it because it offered an alternative, but not so different that people were confused and said, oh, this thing's not even Christian. I don't want anything to do with it, right? 
Now, again, there's some things you, you know, uh, it maybe kind of jumped out at you, especially if you're, you're, if you're not a particularly religious person, is where she talks about how uh, openness to the leading of the spirit. I mean, that's a, a little surprising, but uh, Dr. Tori is a, a practicing a Christian. And I would have, uh, again, I would have said, ask her to qualify that sentence because this was a secular journal. But in any case, I hope that you've seen in this lecture how it's important to read secondary sources carefully, to think about the authors, to identify bias, but at the same time to note that bias is not necessarily terrible because we all have them. The key thing is just to be aware of it and to take advantage of, of uh, to take advantage when we do see it, to know what we should do about it. And if it goes too far, just say, okay, I'll use a different source rather than this one.